It is uh, absolutely a great honor to be here. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's when I heard about the EBBF conference coming up here in London, I was really delighted because I'm uh, an EBBF member for, I think, about 15 years now, right? And it's, it's just something spectacular. And to see this room being sold out, it's really, it's really, really inspiring. Because uh, my journey with the EBBF started in 2004. And I just want to share a little bit about the impact of the EBBF, what it can be, actually, what it can mean. Uh, I was at that conference actually by accident. It was at the port. It's a conference center in the Netherlands. And um, it was a client of mine, and I delivered something. And I was with my colleague, Oscar, who was here as well. And uh, he said, you know, just step in. It's, it's supposed to be interesting. Just listen to some of the things, and then you can leave, right? So it was an accidental meeting. And um, I sat down, and I heard some great speakers, or actually some great people speaking. And they were sharing their insights. And as, a, as an individual person, as a friend of Oscar and inspired by many friends, I was concerned with the world already in 2004. And those people were talking about the subject that mattered to me, about how can we make this world work for other people? How can we solve the problems and challenges ahead? And I remember particularly one part of one presentation where one of the friends said, like, we cannot depend upon political systems to make it better. We need to start doing it ourselves. And for me, that was a call that made me responsible as an entrepreneur to really start directing my energies towards helping to improve the world with whatever capacities I could develop. Since that moment, I can tell you that the EBBF has been the birth ground of everything that we do. I have found friends, I have found accompaniment, knowledge, support, I have found a global network that helps me to do the work and deliver the work that we do to other people. So I think if, if you want to ask the question, why are you here and what can you do and what can you learn? You know, it can actually build a company and a career <laughs> and a happy human being that feels happy. So I think uh, uh, that's why I'm really happy because if it can only do a, a slight little bit of attempt of what it has done to me, I'm quite hopeful for this world if I see a hundred people sitting here, right? Um, maybe uh, when Omid uh, introduced me, he said his name is Sjoerd Lutein. I think that was very, very powerful. I've been traveling a lot abroad and it's very hard to pronounce and he did a tremendous job. So that's fantastic. This is how you write it. I'm not sure if it helps, but you know, if you've seen it written out, it's, uh, it's, 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 you can recognize it. Uh, as Omid said, I'm from a company called Soul.com. And I founded this company with Oscar uh, accidentally or not accidentally in 2004 when I met with the EBBF. It was a progression of our friendship and our work we did before. Um, it was not called Sol.com at the beginning. It was called Refresh Interactions and it became Sol.com halfway during the journey. And I think that is an interesting thought in itself that things progress and change when they become more mature. Um, our work is, we used to call it transforming companies into communities. And um, lately I was wondering, is it really companies? Because we also work with universities and we work with other projects uh, that come around. But listening also to the presentation of NAVA, I realized it's, it's such a powerful thing to see where are the people, where can we meet the people? How can we harness both their capacities to do something good but also to do it in a, in directed towards the betterment of society. So I was reconfirmed with this thought, transforming companies into communities is a very important contribution to be made. Um, there's many things I could share about that experience uh, and, and about the work that we do. If I just explain it practically, is we have developed a method. There's a, a book over there, I can share it with you later. It's a course on capacity building. It's to build capacities in people or to help people build their capacity to become community builders. And the course is called Soul Driven Leadership. It consists of several steps, the things that we have learned, and it's evolutionary, so it, will, it is still growing and changing, and it will continue like that with all the experiences that we have. Uh, a recent development that we have is we have developed a program called Architects of the Future. And it's a program that uh, taps into universities, and I, I reckon it will move into high schools and other forms of education, where young people are actually um, 
being a company to build their capacity also, to be an architect of the future, to be a protagonist in this world, to be hopeful, to be an agent of change. And also to start asking, asking questions about the ethical foundation of our life and of our world. And it's, 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 we started with that a few years ago together with some other friends of the EBBF. We're learning more and more and this program is maturing as we speak. More universities around the world are now being interested and we're learning a lot about it. So I think it's a very interesting field. Maybe even one of the most hopeful fields for me uh, currently. Because seeing young people so uh, enthusiastically and so warmly picking up these ideas and not leaving schools disappointed going back into corporate life, but actually to be agents of change. And the third field of our activity, we call that agents of change. And that's really a space where the individual can build their capacity to be an agent of change, be it at their workplace, in their streets, wherever. Um, when I was preparing for this conference, I always asked myself the question like, what can we contribute to the dialogue? It's not about me speaking or sharing thoughts or whatever. It's how can we try to, to, uh, to bring in thoughts and experiences to the discourse and how can we awaken in people the capacity to really direct their energies towards the betterment of society. So reading the theme was collaborative business, how organizations can, and people can transform each other. The word end is missing, very interesting. <laughs> but actually can help each other. And I think this taps really into the work that we do transforming companies into communities because it talks about the transformation of all the players in that field. So the question that I started to prepare really was, what have we learned as Sol.com, what it means to being an agent of change? What, what, can we, what have we learned from that? What can I contribute to that, to that question and to your experience? And how can we learn about this together? I think uh, it was very interesting to hear Neva's uh, talk. And I thought one of the, one of the uh, thoughts that she brought into my mind was that altruism is not just a human quality, we could actually also consider it as a capacity. And I thought that's a very interesting thought. And when we talk about these capacities, often we think about how can an organization do something good for society or, right? And I think the, the, one of the last questions like, what if you're not in a position to change the course of your organization? One of the things that we've learned in the development of Agents of Change is that we can think about being an agent of change from me to society, me developing a product that is meaningful and whatever comes with that. But I also can be an agent of change within my organization, with my colleagues, with my peers, because there's much more hope needed than just another product that is good. That's also needed, but it also starts inside the organization. So I think there's already a space where meaning can be derived from, is actually to transform the workplace from within. And I thought it was an interesting thought to look at altruism as a capacity. And then I realized, like, in preparing this presentation, I was thinking about uh, a friend of mine that I met um, this week. And we were having a coffee at the place where I mostly start my day. And um, we were talking a little bit about his work and the work that we do. It was a long time since we met. And this guy is absolutely driven because he's chosen a career, as a, he's a philosopher, and he's chosen a career to really think about how can I help people to thrive, how can I help to change things. But one of the things that struck me also was uh, some of the disappointments that he walked into. Some experiences of powerlessness to change something. So when, when I was thinking about this guy and our conversation, I thought, this is also me. So this person is not just the guy I was talking to, this is also me, or it can also be you. And I think what I would like to start with, things about that we've learned, is to also talk about what Nava said, this idea of the altruism gap, or trap, like to spur up and to really get into there. One of the things that, that we've learned, talking to many people who try to be an agent of change to their own capacity, is that sometimes they get confused. Is what I'm doing, does it really matter? Or people become angry. Like, it's not fair what is happening outside. It's not right, and they become angry. People start to develop ideas of opposition. Me versus the other. I need to do something, and they need to do something. And People develop even feelings or 
attitudes of indifference by closing the door at the end of the day and, and put up your programs or whatever and say, okay, forget about it. Or some people really start to focus on one thing. This is the most important thing and this is the only thing that matters. We've learned that all these traps, all these ideas come to table. The idea of blaming someone else, be it in your company or something, right? It's, it's something that happens once you try to do something good and it's hard to do. This is, yeah, you have to jump over that gap. All of these things we come across in having these conversations with people, and I think they are actually true. People experience this and it's very hard to deal with these thoughts. And we started to ask the question, what is the, the thought that comes to mind, the habit of thought that you have when these feelings come up? And I think Nava also mentioned this, and I think also Omid in the beginning when he talked about the, the, to, to diffuse the gap between me and the other, right, to take that away, is that we start to think in division. To see me and the other as something separate. And then all of these things set in place. What we've learned is that division can actually lead to cynicism, where cynicism is really an expression of powerlessness, of the, not the ability to, see, to think like, I can change something. It leads to an attitude of apathy, not always, but often. Like the feeling that you feel powerless, you cannot act, you cannot do something, which even strengthened this idea of of division, of me and the other, and the CEO or the management or something outside myself. And I think it's very painful to see also youth or other people, or sometimes even myself, <laughs> are being brought to that feeling. So we started to think about learning about be, what it means to be an agent of change. You know, what, what, can we, what can we do? How can we change it? Because these feelings of powerlessness, to feel like you cannot influence, is not congruent with my understanding of what it means to be human. It doesn't fit with my, with my view of man. So we started to ask the question, what can we do? In 2013, 14, 14 I think, no 16, 2016, I was in New York with Oscar. And we were having some conversations with some friends there. Uh, we were also presenting some of our experiences on an EBBF breakfast, very nice, with many people, so it's starting to get familiar here. <laughs> and I, re I just had a, a brief experience, and I wanted to share that with you guys. Uh, we were walking on the streets, and um, I was looking for the roads, so I was checking my phone, and, and like, looking like this, and, and somewhere in the corner of my eye, I saw a, guy, a guy walking by. And he walked up to a traffic light waiting to cross the road. And the light was red, so... And I don't know why I saw him, but he was like this in this visual space of, of my view. And when the light went to green, I saw him starting to move. But he stopped. And he turned around and came back. And he said, are you looking for something? I said, yes, I'm looking for this. And he pointed the way. And, it, and then he w walked on, he had to wait again and cross the road. And it was a very simple story. It was a very simple experience. And it seems very insignificant, very small, very tiny. But it's not insignificant to me, because it helped me. Uh, a few weeks later, I went for my daily coffee at the, the coffee place, which is at the, close to our office. And um, I had a bad day. I walked down from the subway. I just had one of those days that I felt like, you know, you better stay in bed or something like that. I just had not very positive thoughts. And I walked up, I went for my coffee, it didn't help, my shot of happiness. And I walked away, and here's a little garbage bin. And I saw some of the cups, paper cups, laying outside the garbage bin. And I walked away, and I, you know, like the guy, it was still somewhere in my vision. And I stopped, and I realized, like, I can go back and actually pick it up. And I did it. I turned around, walked back to the, to the, to the garbage bin, picked the stuff up, threw it in, and walked away. And it also sounds really insignificant. It's not about me being a hero. Yet it was important. Because at that moment, my whole day changed. 
I realized I could actually think and make a decision of what I do and how I do it. And every decision I made that day was done with a different attitude. There's a quote from uh, a man who's very ins inspiring to me, it's Viktor Frankl, and he says, between stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space is our power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and our freedom. For me, that's something really interesting to realize. And ob obviously, many of the actions that I take and many of the things that I do and also many of the things that I see others do, we can just do it like on automated pilot. But sometimes there's this moment when you can actually experience the, the moment of, of changing a course, feeling you want to do something on a reflex, but you don't. You stop, you think, and you choose another course. And I think these experiences are also the experiences that make us that really take from us uh, the quality to, to change the course of life. There's one way to look at the world, and that's with the eyes of the vision. Seeing the other, putting the things outside myself. But there's also another view that we can choose. And that's the, the, the view of oneness. And I think this is really a radical idea. It's, it's not just some simple concept that we can plant into our head and says, yes, I, I have one. I have so much challenges with grasping this. But to view the humanity as one, not as separate parts, but as one, first and foremost, is a radical thought with radical implications, although this is how I experience it. In the initial introduction that Omid read, there is this quote from Buckminster Fuller that is important to my work, and to our work, I think. And he was writing a book in the 60s, it's called Operation Manual for Spaceship Earth, and he considered what is the task of humanity on this Earth. And he said, it is our task to make the world work for 100% of humanity. And he continued, he said, in the shortest possible time, through spontaneous cooperation, without ecological offense or disadvantage to anyone. And I think to grasp this idea of 100% of humanity is, is moving towards this understanding of what man, oneness of mankind implies. It's one way of understanding it. Another way of looking at it, and I, I was just reading um, some of the background is a quote from Albert Einstein, and it's always interesting to, to check whether he actually said it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I found the source. It's in one of the latest letters when he was 70s, when, when he was in Princeton. And there was a, uh, as he has suffered a lot when he was in Princeton on a personal level, losing his second wife and his child, he got a question from a, a rabbi who said, my, my daughter has a lot of challenges with dealing with losing her sister. And in, in the response that Albert Einstein wrote, he shared this quote. And it's a long one, so we'll go through it step by step. He says, a human being is a part of the whole, called by us the universe. A part limited in space and time. He experiences himself, his thoughts and his feelings as something separate from the rest a kind of optical delusion of his consciousness. And then he says, this delusion is a kind of a prison for us, restricting us to our personal desires and to affections for a few persons nearest to us. Our task must be to free ourselves from this prison by widening our circles of compassion to embrace all living creatures and the whole of nature in its beauty. This is one of the things that, you know, it has so much in it, but that when I have challenges viewing the world with the, with the perspective of oneness, I sometimes use this as a mirror. Right? Because the, be, besides there's a lot of knowledge in here, there's also practices. How can I practice to widen my, my circle of compassion? How can I see the other not as the source of my 
inconvenience or suffering or concerns or whatever, but really to understand it from a different perspective. If you see the world with the eyes of oneness, it also has some beautiful consequences. So if, you, if, you're, if you're able somehow to bring up this mental model for a moment and start your day with just nurturing this thought, the things that we hear from agents of change, people that we learn with and from, is that people are able to think inclusive, to see the other as part of working together and of a solution, to, to develop a capacity to forgive the other person. to develop a learning attitude and not be striving from a disappointment to a disappointment, but actually from learnings to learnings and see progress to, to develop an attitude of faithfulness and also to radiate that, to be active, to take small initiatives, to be grateful. And I think if we, if, we just, if we just look at those concepts, we can also realize like this is, we all have also the experiences of thinking for a moment in division and feeling blame and just, you know, thinking in oppositions. Very subtle. It's not like a conscious decision. It's all of a sudden it's there. But we also have the experience of being grateful and forgiving and hopeful. The dynamics of oneness, seeing with oneness, is we've seen that hope is really emerging in yourself. And I don't mean hope like, let's sit down and hope for the best. I mean like hope like an active vision, the capacity to see. Vision for me is not a, a document or a statement. It's a capacity to recognize reality, not to cover it up, but to recognize reality, but also to see the potentialities, what is possible. Thinking in oneness open up this, this space of hope. And hope actually brings about the feeling of taking personal initiatives, which actually feeds into this vision of oneness. It's a strengthening loop. And really, to, to, this is one of the things that I've learned, is to have that capacity to take initiatives, even if they're small, even if they seem insignificant, like stopping at the street to point the way. Just, you know, if you feel the calling to clean something, to do it. <laughs> it's both reinforcing this power to take personal initiatives, but it's also a practice because it, this man in New York has no idea that I'm still talking about him uh, three, four years later. <laughs> I even don't his, know his name, right? But it's really unlocking this capacity to be an agent of change. Now, I'm thinking about this person as myself or as the other, and I'm really realizing that I have a choice. And not just for once in my life, but every day or every moment. I can have to choose the, whether I choose for the view of the vision of the view of oneness. And it's not really simple, but you can try. It's all about the habit of thoughts that we try to nurture. So, um, I'm changing the dynamics a little bit, so it's not me talking for half an hour and then asking questions. I actually, I think we have the knowledge in the room here to, to actually build this capacity to be an agent of change. So, I would like to ask you to, in your table, to have a conversation for about 15 minutes around a question. And actually to see, can we get up some of, new, of, the, of the insights and share that with the audience to really inspire each other to learn what, how do I wake in this spirit of being an agent of change in myself. And most of you already have that because that's also why you're here, but how can we strengthen that? And what can we learn from the experiences that we have? To have a conversation like this at the EBBF, we call that a meaningful conversation. A conversation that leads to shared understanding, where we can re really reorient our perspectives, learn something new, where we feel elevated and strengthened, and where we can expand our consciousness. And the learning question that, that we thought of before entering that conversation is what thoughts help me to take more personal initiatives? And with personal initiatives, I mean personal initiatives leading to, to more unity in society. 
So you could take any personal initiatives. I'm looking for the initiatives that help to betterment society. So what thoughts help me on a daily basis, in our daily lives, in the rat race of life, not to think in divisions, but to think in oneness? I was also thinking about preparing this presentation is a friend of ours who's working in a large um, governmental institution in the Scandinavian countries. And he started to develop his capacity to be an agent of change a few years ago. And he started to take individual actions. But then he realized it became more complex because he can really train his, his thoughts and he can really try to, to reflect upon his actions and to learn from that and to try to purify his motives. And that's really encouraging because that's the question that we've been looking at, right? How can we develop a thought that's focused on oneness rather than on division? It awakens in me this capacity to be an agent of change. But then it came more complex because he had to deal with colleagues and he realized that he could do so much more if they were expanding these circles of, of, of thinking in oneness. There's a quote that I think in this moment is crucial to realize. And um, the quote says, we cannot segregate the human heart from the environment outside us and say that once one of these is reformed, everything will be improved. It says, man is organic with the world. His inner life molds the environment and is itself also deeply affected by it. The one acts upon the other and ever abiding change in the life of man is the result of these mutual reactions. To think in oneness means that, for me at least, to really realize that I am one with my environment. I'm not a separate part, as Einstein talked about it. And I need to realize that I need to expand my circles of compassion. And this is what we saw with this guy in this institution. He was not trying to convince his colleagues to be agents of change. He was trying to already see them as agents of change. He was not giving arguments how to do things different. He was encouraging things they were already doing that was contributing. And he started to create higher and higher impact. Not he as an individual, but the group, and then a larger group. And now really a movement has started inside that institution where people feel like they are encouraged to be agents of change. Maybe they don't have a label or a name, but they just do. And I think it's very interesting to think about thinking in oneness means that it also includes myself. I'm not thinking about you in oneness, but I'm part of that. And although I have, you know, I'm part of that oneness, I'm also an individual who can make choices. We have learned something about how that process also works into creating conditions that build a space where these agents of change can grow, where people really can become participants. Because if I think about that statement of Buckminster Fuller, where he said, it is our task to make the world work for 100% of humanity, it doesn't mean that a few people can do that work for other people. For me, there is a consequence, a logical consequence actually from that statement, and that says that everybody has to be a participant in that process. I cannot make the world work for you if you're not part of that process. And I think this is really, the next level of, you know, we can ask ourselves, what can I do? How can I develop my, my habits of thoughts in order to, you know, view the world with oneness and be hopeful and, and take initiatives? But I also can think about the environment that we're in. How can I create conditions that actually, that like you have conditions for a flower to blossom, we can create conditions in, in our work that can actually awaken this ability to be an agent of change in people. And there's a set of learning questions that we have learned as Sol.com about how to transform these organizations into these spaces. And I think this would also be an interesting space to explore together. And one of the things that we've seen is, at the end, it works up to really building unity at all levels. But sometimes it's very hard to start there. So one of the first conditions that we have found is to create an environment of trust. An environment where you feel you can express your thoughts where you can actually challenge your assumptions, where you can look at certain situations from different perspectives and consider other perspectives or understanding of truths, 
where you can really learn to work together, a space where you can be yourself. How often do we see that in our workplaces? Right? So the, one of the first things to ask ourselves the questions is, what can we do to create an environment of trust? But then it becomes more systematic and we realize that the next question is really, how can we develop a space where hope can grow? And with hope I refer to this idea to having visions about where we can go to, not maybe where we are, not maybe if we're finished in the next step, but a direction of travel, to read reality for what it is right now, but also to see potential. Another question that we have found is, if this journey starts to really found solid ground, there's a question about solidarity, mutual support. How can we help each other, each of one of, one of us in our own way, to be an agent of change? Right? I think you've said it every uh, about uh, the, the quote from you too, right? We're one, but we're not the same. So it really has to be a space where everybody with their own potentials and struggles can participate, a space of mutual support and learning. Solidarity also comes from the word solid, actually. And it's, for me, it also means that in this stage of development, the vision becomes more solid, more grounded. There's a space where we need to embrace diversity on all levels, because if it's becoming a growing group, we've seen this also in the, in the companies that we're working with, it becomes more complex because people from different views, different ideas, different genders, different ethical backgrounds, cultural backgrounds, hierarchies, I don't know, come into play. And we need to embrace that diversity in order for it to learn more. And the last question is really how to create unity at all levels. These are questions that come into play when we think about creating an environment that really awakens in people the spirit of being a protagonist, an agent of change. So on one hand we can really think about ourselves, and on the other hand we can really think how can we create an environment that awakens this in people. Just to summarize what we have learned <laughs> is that at one hand or some of us are discouraged by thinking in the vision. <laughs> And it's very subtle, it comes down to our language, uh, where it is expressed. And it's very um, confirming and empowering to try to think in oneness. Really to become aware of the habits of our thoughts and try to alter them subtly, like the man who stopped at the traffic light and decided not to do what work on the push that he felt to be in time somewhere, but to turn around and just to ask a question. We all have that ability to make a decision and to ask the question, what is the impact of what I'm trying to say? Or what is the impact of my thought? As the quote of Shoghi Fendi also said, the inner life molds the environment and in turn creates, helps us to become what we are. We can think about the initiative in any direction, but if any, we can take initiatives that promote trust, that helps to create hope, that really becomes create an environment where solidarity amongst people is growing, where diversity is embraced rather than emphasized, and where unity is being merged at all levels. This is our key learning, and we can see that all mm -hmm. of us have experiences that actually give practice to that. I hope that it helps you to actually become an active agent of change. You already are, but to really strengthen that power, because I think that act, that initiative, that little thing that seems insignificant, that's really where hope comes from. So thank you very much, and I wish you a very nice lunch. <laughs>